session and starting the session uh, welcome you all and uh, let's understand some basic nuances of uh, landscape photography today okay uh, when i started my journey on landscape photography uh, guys for me landscape was you know when you are going in a car you see a beautiful sunset you stop your car roll down your window take out your cell phone or take out your mobile camera or take out your camera and just click sitting in a car and you say wow what a sunset it was okay but uh, over a period of time uh, my perception or my understanding about the landscape photography changed totally okay uh, and based on my experience guys i am going to share with you some fine nuances or some important factors uh, which one needs to consider while going for this landscape photography okay guys there are few things uh, i know it's too technical but i expect uh, people to understand this because this is nothing uh, but the basics on your photography thing whether it is a landscapes or a wildlife or a street or a travel okay especially in the landscape photography friends uh, you need to understand the depth of field uh, it is so very crucial okay uh, your camera position your point of view is so so very important because see all these days we are shooting portraits we are shooting wildlife uh, every time we try to achieve that you know uh, go to the eye level and shoot it but in landscape that eye level is is not not a recommended in fact in fact you should go little low little high you can shoot at eye level at some times but a low angle or a high angle always give a different perspective to your images uh, your understanding of light is again so much important you need to work with the light okay uh there is something called as focal point or a point of interest uh, if you if you add some elements in your photographs uh it's always your landscapes will always look good uh guys the most important concept and why landscape photography is different from other genre is uh, a factor called as foreground because all these days when we talk about wildlife photography we're shooting tigers elephants mammals butterflies people we talk about the subject and the background what is there in the background but in the landscape photography guys there is one more element added and that element is foreground you have to work on your foregrounds and the foreground is the one thing which actually separates you from the rest of the crowd when you do your landscape photography uh framing and composition again like any other genres this is a important uh, aspect or a factor and the most important uh is you have to work with the weather seasons and the sky because if you don't plan your trip uh don't expect your uh, photos will come nice for that particular trip before we actually go into those final nuances guys i mean a little bit on camera settings and when i'm talking about camera settings i'm talking in general okay so we'll talk about camera modes we talk about you know raw versus jpeg uh, isos why it is important and yeah most important is white balance okay when we talk about camera mode guys okay there are various options we have in your camera not even camera even now the latest cell phones also phone cameras also so they have these options you have option of manual mode you have aperture priority mode or av mode we call it we call it shutter priority also a tv mode in canon what they say and then we have bulk mode now uh, i don't think very few cell phones they have this mode called bulk mode but all the slrs they have this mode called bulk mode because uh, to for those who use the dslrs guys if you if you recollect in the aperture priority mode or shutter priority mode uh, if you go lower on your shutter speed uh, max you can go around 30 seconds but if you want to shoot some very long exposure shots like 2 minutes 3 minutes okay 4 minutes 5 minute in that case you have to go to the bulk mode and the bulk mode typically is available in your manual mode inside your camera or some cameras they have on their dialing mode the bulk mode is given there okay so but i'll tell you there are a lot of people all the pros they use manual mode and all the rookies or beginners they use aperture priority mode i i i differ on that you use any mode it gives the same features you can do everything in aperture priority mode which you can do in your manual mode in fact i'll tell you my personal experience whether it is landscapes or whether it is wildlife 80% of the time i use my aperture priority mode i use manual mode whenever i use the external light especially flat flash lights and all the stuff okay so your av mode if you are good in uh, even in landscape uh, photography you can actually continue using your aperture priority mode uh yeah we always say shoot in raw and uh, we all know the difference now the uh, the 
raw images always give a better dynamic range, you know, right from your darkest area to the brightest area, everything you can cover it uh, well in raw. Uh, raw basically is an uncompressed uh, file. I mean, you can shoot 12 bit or 14 bit. By default, all the Canon cameras, they shoot at 12 bit. Nikon, the factory setting gives you 12 bit, but you can select the 14 bit also in the raw. The most important uh, feature of shooting in the raw is you can avoid a side effect or I would call an artifact called as posturization. What is this posturization? We'll quickly see in the next slides. Uh, image editing is very easy if you shoot raw because you have a lot of latitude to play with your shadows and highlights and exposure and all the stuff. Okay. The only con shooting in raw is you have to edit your image. Now you can't just post your raw image just like that on your social media. You have to process that image. You have to convert your raw file into your JPEG or a TIFF or a PSD and probably you can uh, put it on your social media. When I was talking about that artifact guys, posturization, now this is a typical histogram of an image where you see a lot of data in between. Couple of things on the left hand side, which is the darker side and the brighter side, it, it is unused. So when what we do when we actually edit that image, what we do is simple. We stretch our blacks and whites, we stretch our shadows and highlights, and we try to get to that zero point and that 255 point, right? This is what we do. And believe me, guys, in the raw image, you see your histogram is, is uh, responds very well when you actually stretch these colors. But what happens in JPEG image? When you start editing your JPEG images, you will see some kind of lines in your histogram. And these lines are nothing but the posturization or what we call it the banding. Now, what is banding? If you observe the sky, many times when we post our images into social media like Facebook or Instagram, in the sky, you will see some band, some line kind of thing, especially in the sky area, you know, and that is nothing but the banding. So it is, it is always recommended, please, if you got an opportunity, shoot in RAW. In fact, all the latest uh, good cellular phones, okay, they also offer a facility to shoot in RAW. When my equipment has got a facility to shoot in RAW, why not shoot in RAW? So it is my recommendation, guys, whether it is any genre of photography, try to shoot in RAW, process your image, and then post that image. And that's the ad hoc. Uh, ISOs, okay, it is very, very important. Uh, if, you, if you talk about today the cameras or your cell phones, you from 100 ISO to almost in lakhs, okay? So, but, but especially in landscape photography, guys, it is recommended to work with a low ISO. Uh, there is a term called as a native ISO. Every camera manufacturer gives that native ISO. So most of a Nikon and camera, Canon cameras, DSLRs, they have a native ISO of 100. So when you have that, ISO as a native ISO, please stick to that. Don't try to push it. Because in the landscape photography, I always use a tripod. So shutter speed is not an issue for me. Since I'm using tripod, I can afford to go low on the ISO. But if someone says, can I use a landscape photography without a tripod? Yes, you can if the light is good. But if you, if you, if you, if you think of landscape photography, the best of the landscape photography happens during the sunset and sunrise time, where the available light is very low. So it is recommended to use a tripod. Okay, so lower ISO also ensures a very low noise level. So you don't have those artifacts and it also ensures a superior image quality. So guys, stick to lowest possible ISO. Now this is very unlikely to your wide light because in wide light, we don't use tripod. The sightings happen very early morning, late evening. We have to boost your ISO. But in landscape, you have the time in your hand. So please stick to the lowest possible ISO guys. Uh, the one factor which normally neglect is white balance. In fact, a couple of times in the field while working, a lot of people, they say, guys, keep it on auto, uh, auto white balance. Let's see, we can do it always in post. But believe me, when we go for a trip, it's like seven day or eight day trip, okay? It is not possible to recollect the settings on day one when you finish your eight day trip. So it is better to work with the prevalent white balance. So what is this white balance, guys? White balance is simple in a simple word. Your white should come as white. <laughs> So that's why you have to adjust your white balance. So in your camera, you have various settings like daylight and sunny, cloudy. You can also select in the presets, like there's a Kelvin's you can select, right? Always choose your white balance to the prevailing light, guys. And that is very, very important. If I go back in time, 
And when we talk about the uh, the roll photography or the slides photography, when we started our journey, guys, we never had a freedom to choose our white balance in terms of inside the camera. Okay, we used to buy film rolls, and the roll used to come as a daylight film or a tungsten film. So whatever you shoot in that daylight, right, from morning six to evening six, you have to select the daylight film. Wherein, if you shoot something in the night, you used to select. See something called as a tungsten film, but now in your camera you have the entire range available. If you ask me what by white balance I select, I normally play around eighty percent of time on the daylight white balance. If it is too cloudy or especially using sunset and sunrise, if I want to have those orange colors, I might go on the presets and the kelvins where I go up to eight thousand, nine thousand kelvins. Okay. Surprisingly, guys, you have something called as auto white balance, and believe me, auto white balance works best, especially in the night sky and indoor shoots. Because indoor shoots, you have various light sources. Sometimes you have tube lights, sometimes you have bulbs, sometimes you have some uh, uh, the available light which is coming through the window and all. In that case, your white balance may 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 get fooled. So there, prefer can go with auto white balance. But guys, if you know what is the source of light, you can actually select the correct preset. Okay, so. white balance is important don't just totally depend on the auto white balance guys i wanted to give you one example now this image is shot in ladakh and uh, this is a shanti stupa uh, which is shot from uh, opposite hill and if you see there's a beautiful sunset glow the first image on the left i shot with a daylight white balance the second one i put it on the cloudy and the third one i put it in the shade now if you see the sky you get some amazing blue colors in the daylight settings but what happened to my oranges they gone for a toss the orange doesn't look like orange but when i actually shoot the shade look at this orange this orange is exactly look like what i was look through uh, i mean when i was looking at that, that particular little scape during that time but what happened to my blues it's gone for a toss and that's why guys whenever you shoot landscape though we call it it's a easy genre no it's not easy because you need to spend some good time in processing also because you can't you can't get those correct colors in in every frame okay you need to do many times a bracketing of your exposure or some bracketing of your white balance also which a lot of people they do it but here typically if you ask me i would go with somewhere around cloudy because i want that orange to be important because it's a sunset time okay the blues i can always get back in my post so this is the difference guys with your that one slight change in the white balance your entire color spectrum changes so one has to be very very careful while choosing the white balance okay camera and lenses one should use in 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 the landscape photography guys i always go with the full frame cameras because as you know the dx cameras or the crop body cameras they have that 1.4 or 1.5 crop so you don't get that wide angle so it is recommended you go with a full frame camera but if you don't have a full frame you can still do with your dx cameras but then you have to get that wide angle lenses uh my favorite wide angle lenses i am a nikon both i use in fact both nikon as well as canon uh nikon has got a beautiful lens called 1424 it's 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 like a built like a tank it's an amazing lens very sharp it's a two pointed lens uh i use both canon 2470 as well as uh, nikon also And seventy two hundred guys, uh, don't get surprised. Please carry seventy two hundred with you when you go for your landscape shoots because there are some landscapes, especially in Ladakh, Spiti, and Iceland. The things are very very distant. Okay, you need to zoom in a lot sometimes to take the monasteries on the hillocks and all the stuff. Okay, so at least carry three lenses, uh, three different focal lenses. You know, when you when you go for this uh, landscape shoots. uh i always recommend please carry fast lenses when i say fast lenses which has got the lowest f value in terms of f 1.8 or 2.8 values you have couple of lenses available now all my lenses uh 1424 lens 2470 is a 2.8 as well as 7200 is 2.8 why this 2.8 lens which i'll which i'll talk in detail when we talk about the night okay uh all these 1.8 2.8 lens guys they are pretty costly ah uh, but then you have some brands like samyang or loa i mean they come out with some amazing faster lenses but they all are manual lenses and believe me guys i mean manual lenses i shoot everything in manual in terms of landscape photography i don't use my autofocus okay and how 
I'll, I'll just quickly take you through. So you have a couple of options here, okay, in lenses. Now, this is a typical example. Uh, this particular lighthouse is shot during the suns uh, with 14, 24 mm lens. Okay, and that's why you see a very wide angle shot. You can see the rocks. And in fact, uh, there was a small streak of my tripod also was visible in this image, which I just cloned it off. Okay, it is so wide, that 1424 Nikon. Okay, next day evening, I shot the same scape with my 70 to 200 mm lens at 200 mm. Okay, I mount my 70 to 200 lens on a tripod, and this is the shot. It's the same image, a same place, and two different lenses, and your entire perspective changes. Okay, and that's why you have to work with various wide angle lenses. Now, a lot of people they ask, I mean, I'm going for a landscape shoot, which wide angle should I carry? I said, okay, you carry the widest possible with the fastest aperture like 1.8 or 2.8 if you can but please carry your other lenses also because your other lenses will give a different perspective all together okay along with the lenses guys this is one new thing which we don't touch upon in the white lights uh, sector is the filters there are various filters available uh, i use circular polarizing filter which typically cuts down on the reflections uh, if darkens the blue sky, if the sky is already slightly blue, uh, I use neutral density filters to cut down the light, okay? And then I use a grad anti filters. But I'll tell you guys now, uh, since you have a lot of good tools available in, in post-processing for an ACR or a room where you can actually create a grad anti effect, uh, nowadays I don't spend much money on the grad anti filters uh, because grad anti filters works best when the horizon is absolutely straight. In India, typically we have a lot of hills, uh, so you don't get the straight horizons. It is good for the sun, I mean, the sunsets on the beaches, okay, but not on the mountainous terrains. So I don't uh, recommend. Don't if you don't have grad ND, you can avoid it. You can create effect in your post. But ND filters and the circular polarizing filters are uh, very very important, okay. Uh, a good landscape photographer will always have this in his kitty. And why we need these filters, we'll see that, okay. Check this image, guys, on your screen. Now, this is a busy waterfall near Mumbai, okay? And uh, the problem with the big cities is that you go to any of these waterfalls, you always see it is always surrounded by the people. The people are already there, okay? But, guys, observe. Observe the reflections typically on these rocks. Now, next to the waterfall, the rock is so shiny. You can see a lot of reflection of a, a waterfall in the water. But check the image on the right. Guys, the reflections are totally gone. You just rotate your circular polarizing filter and the reflections are gone. That's the beauty of uh, the circular polarizing filter. Now, see, a lot of people, they use circular polarizing filter to get that uh, blue color in the sky. But guys, for that, your sky has to be very nice and clean. And there has to be some blue so you can add that effect. If your sky is too cloudy, murky, don't expect that blue thing will happen. But... Circular polarizing filter is best to avoid that reflections, that glare. Okay, and this is this that's the reason why I don't go for a landscape shoot without my circular polarizing filter. ND filters they are good to cut down the lights. Guys, I'll tell you the time when I shot this particular location in Mumbai. The, this is near Bandstand. That's a famous ceiling beach. This is somewhere around 11 a.m. in the morning. The light was too harsh. So when without the filters, my shutter speed, despite of me going on F16, it was not going less than one by 30th of a second. But I wanted to achieve that 2.5 seconds speed. And that's why I lowered on my ISO. I put my nine stop ND filter, which is absolutely dark class. Okay. And then I shoot. The moment you shoot all this, this waves and the waterfalls at very, very um, long shutter speed. Now this is at 2.5 seconds you get this beautiful, silky, smooth water. In fact, a lot of people, uh, I would say there is a trick. If you go to a busiest monument like Taj Mahal and all, and you wanted to shoot Taj Mahal without people, what you can do is you can actually put a very large ND filter, like a 10-stop filter, 9-stop filter, and you take multiple shots. So what happens if anything moves during that time, that time frame, that image will come absolutely without the people. And that's, that's the beauty of this ND filters. So in the, even in the daytime,
time on the busiest morning events, you can actually take a longer shots like one minutes, two minutes or not. And it is possible if you start using these empty filters. Okay, that's one trick you can always try. Now, this is again a waterfall which is shot near Mumbai. And if you see that beautiful silky smooth water here, it is achieved with that six second exposure. The shutter speed is so long. And believe me guys, when I talk about a very long exposure, anything less by less than one by 30th of a second, I always go for a tripod. All the shots are taken using tripod, okay? ISO is very low, 200. Again, I'm using my, uh, the Hoya filter, which is a nine stop filter. And this is the time of the day. This is near Koina, Maharashtra. Again, a beautiful waterfall during the sunset. Uh, this is near Nasik. Uh, this is one of my favorite place. And if you see the moment in the clouds, typical happens during the monsoon time. And this exposure is of 30 seconds. Okay, definitely I'm on a tripod shooting during the sunset time. And you have this beautiful, beautiful glow. Okay, today I'm going to share one secret, you know. Uh, which probably uh, on the later uh, this evening went to shoot this beautiful colors in the sky. Okay, that's a secret. So wait till the end. I'll just reveal that. The most important thing, guys, is you have to understand something called as depth of field. I mean, we all hear about this term called depth of field. Believe me, guys. Uh, for me, when you talk about a good frame or a good image, 80% of the time, my uh, perception about a good frame is nothing but a good composition or a good frame. That 20% technical thing, I relate to depth of field. You know, how effectively you can use your depth, okay? It, it is nothing but uh, how much skills you have. So what is this depth of field? I, I'm, I'm sure a couple of you would have heard this term, okay? But for the people who have not uh, uh, heard this term called depth of field, I just, I just give some definition. So we'll, we'll learn what is depth of field, what are the factors which decide your depth of field, what are these narrow apertures? How they help, and what is hyperfocal distance? Again, it's it's a it's an alien term, you know, for for all the wildlife photographers called hyperfocal distance. But believe me, all my landscape friends, they they, they know it. What is hyperfocal distance? So let's simplify this depth of field. Okay, depth of field is nothing but you know, it's a simple word, simple word. Let's not make things complicated. It's an area or a zone within which everything is relatively sharp. Okay, before that everything is blur. After that everything is blur. And Typically, we see that if you shoot a wildlife or a tiger at 2.8 or f4, before anything comes, which is goes blur, then the tiger is sharp and then the background, right? Same with the birds, Atikamam, right? You see a lot of this blurring of background and all which you can achieve with yeah, subject and time f4 time. and yes. absolutely. So here, there are actually in the landscape photography, the things are exactly opposite. Things are ulta. Here we want everything to be sharp, right from yeah. the bush in the front to the mountain, which is almost two kilometers away from me, and on the distant horizon, that mountain there in the far distance here. Yeah, that foreground to sharp. background. Because once you, absolutely, foreground to background. And this is what I mean by a foreground. A nice bush, which is lit by the sunlight, is actually creates that frame. Okay, look at this image. Even though this is shot in Mishmi Hills in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, this is a very famous river there and look at the stones they are sharp this bridge is sharp this jungle is sharp and the mountains are sharp and this is what we wanted to achieve when we actually go for the landscape and how to achieve you have to manage your depth of field right and how to manage your depth of field three things friends three things okay please remember this we all know aperture okay you you reduce the f value depth of field is small you increase the f value depth of field is bigger that is one thing but Along with the guys, there are two important things which actually also decides on your depth of field. One is a focal length, and the second one is a focal distance. Now, what is focal length? Focal length is something associated with your lens. Your 16 mm lens, 24 mm lens, 50 mm lens, 200 mm lens, that's the focal length of a lens. So, larger the focal length, like say 200 mm to 400 mm, smaller the depth of field. And that's why smaller the focal length, like 16 mm, 14 mm, large is the depth of field. And that's why, friends, we go with wide angle lenses for landscapes. 16 mm, 14 mm, 24 mm, up to 35 mm, you can shoot easily, no worries, okay? What is focal distance in that case? Focal distance, guys, is nothing but the distance between me and my subject, okay? And that is what is important. So, depth of field is not only controlled by aperture, it also controls by your focal length of the lens and the focal distance, okay? So what are the best apertures in landscape photography? 
anything guys from F8 to F22 is good, but F22 we don't use because the lens have one side effect, which is called diffraction. So many times if you try to get that F22 and you'll see your images are not looking very tech sharp. There is some softness in your image. Avoid using or avoid shooting at F22. Purposely I'm putting this because then I don't want you to go and shoot at F22 just to reduce down your shutter speed or sometimes to achieve a great depth. No, F22 is a very dangerous. F11 is my favorite. I go to F16 also at times I went to F13. Between this range, I play around all with all my landscape images. Yeah. Let's talk about this depth of field. And this is something very, very important. For example, if I'm shooting, if you if you see this diagram, a guy shooting this girl. There's a dog sitting in the front, there's a tree hind. He's shooting at f2.8. Okay. And can you see this blue zone here? That entire blue zone, but the depth field zone. So anything within this zone will be sharper. And can you see this blue line here? Now, this blue line is where he's focusing. So when you talk about this entire zone, guys, it is not divided 50 50. It is one third in the front and two third behind. And this is very important. Just imagine, forget about landscape. When we talk about wildlife photography, if you have two or three tigers walking towards you, okay, we always say, guys, try to focus on the front tiger because your depth of field is larger behind. This is of you getting the second tiger also in focus is possible if you try to focus on the front tiger. And that's the reason. It's one third in and two third behind. But what is more important? When I shift from F2.8 to F16, Okay, which is a large F value. Look at this blue zone, it increased. Now this is expanded till the dog and this zone is expanded till the tree. Okay, so this is how your F numbers are very critical. So when we go for the portraits, wildlife, go with the low F number. But when we talk to you guys, this is very important. Okay, now a lot of questions again in the landscape photography, where you are going to shoot right from that table in the front of you to the mountain where to focus should i focus on the mountain or should i focus on on that rock in the front okay now this is the answer can you see this guy shooting this particular flower and there is another flower here if he focuses on this flower now this is your focusing point you have the one third in the front that is a depth of field and two third behind so probably you have this zone to this zone in the focus. But what happened to this distant flower? So if you want to take this in focus, slightly focus behind this flower. And you see this? Now, when I keep my focusing point somewhere over here, the chances are that even this will come sharp and the distant flower also will come sharp. And this is the rule what we apply. So if you have any subject, what we do is we put our camera, mount our camera on a tripod. We try to identify my foreground element. And I try to focus slightly, maybe a two or three feet below that main subject so that my front will come in sharp and then you have your infinity comes in sharp. And believe me, guys, I wanted to give you actually one more case. Infinity. Have you seen this sign on your lenses? This is, we call the infinity sign. And most of your wide angle lenses, they have the glass on top. And in the glass, you see this particular sign, the eight sign. Normally, what I do, if you're not very sure to focus, guys, just keep your lens on the manual mode, select the infinity and shoot it. Okay. And a lot of people, they say, no, this is not a correct way. Uh, the hyperfocal is the best way, you know, or focusing just behind your main subject, two or three feet is a good way. I'll, I'll give you a relative case. Okay. Now, this is the case of my camera. This is Canon 5D Mark IV, lens is 1635. And say, for example, I'm shooting at 16 mm. For example, if I shoot at aperture of f11 the range what i got if i keep on infinity that eight mark if i keep on my lens from 3.78 feet to infinity when i say infinity is the endless everything will be in that sharpness zone but when i select another metal called hyperfocal distance which is just calculate that distance and you focus just behind that uh, subject from 3.22 feet, which is slightly bigger zone compared to this, but if you relatively compare, there is not much difference. So in a simple way, what I do is, when I compose my frames, I make sure my front element or my interesting element is at least four to five feet away from me. 
when I set up my tripod and that four to five feet away from me, I just focus on infinity and I take my shots. And believe me, 90% of the shots, what you see in this presentation are shot at infinity. And I'm able to achieve that, that absolutely uh, good depth of field zone where I get my, my foreground sharper, my background sharper, as well as my midground sharper. Okay. So that's about depth of field. So it's very simple. If you're not very sure where to focus, put it in manual mode and select as infinity. So uh, there's one more thing guys, I wanted to give that disclaimer. Uh, the cheaper lenses like 1855 and all the kit lenses doesn't have the scale on the lens, on top of the lens, okay? So you need to invest, if you want to go, if you're serious about lens photography, invest in the good quality lens where you can actually see this, this uh, uh, scale on top of your lens. It is there in all the bigger and uh, prime lenses, yeah? So, Let's talk about camera positions and point of view, okay? You have to change perspective that eye level, you have to go away from the eye level when we talk about landscape photography. Foreground, midground, background, these are the three important mantras for landscape photography. Guys, you have to work with this, okay? What happens if you don't have foreground? No worries, you can shoot with midground, background, but try to identify something interesting. And, uh, you know, or try to create some in your foreground and background, which probably I'm going to show you with some of the examples. Take multiple frames. Guys, I'll tell you, whenever I go for my shoots on landscapes, I go and set up my tripod. When I set up my tripod and I, when I try shooting, before that, you know what I do? I do one exercise. I just walk 20 feet on left, 20 feet on right, 20 feet front and 20 feet behind. And then I check how that landscape looks from all the possible locations. Because we always think that, ah, this is where I stand, I'll get this. No, don't do that. Take your some shots, move your tripod, go probably left, right, go low, go high, and, and shoot. And guys, please stay focused, okay? If you're going for a landscape shoot, if there's a butterfly comes and sit next to you, if there's a bird, like Ratika Mam's favorite, you know, he'll come and sit next to her, please, Ratika Mam, don't shoot that bird, okay? You have to focus on landscapes. So normally, whenever <laughs> next I time, landscape I will carry I'll my wide angle lens, I mean. <laughs> I am also excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I will carry my so, mind. So stay focused. Lens. Stay focused. Super. <laughs> Amazing session. I am loving it. I am really uh, loving it. All the tips and all. It's for me. It's like a flashback, no? Yeah. So, thank Not you. Thank to come. Please Not carry to come. On. Please carry on. Please carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to disturb. I don't want to disturb. So, so, that's why I'm uh, just watching it. <laughs> I've lost I thought it was going so boring. That's why you're looking absolutely yes. keep. <laughs> I've lost the person at the end of the session. Perfect. So, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, please carry but, on. But, but ma'am, uh, that's my request. If you think anything is uh, important and you definitely, want to talk Definitely, definitely. I am getting questions. No, questions. I just, I am noting down all the questions. Guys, you can uh, ask your doubts in the question yeah. in the comment section. So I am all, uh, no, I am noting down all the questions. So end of the session, after you finish, we will ask, I will ask. Perfect. So let's go ahead. So guys, stay focused, okay? Don't look here and there when you shoot landscape. Because I'll tell you guys, see, when we talk about landscape photography, it's not 12 hour of a day what we got to shoot. Guys, it is that important 15 minutes before sunrise and important 15 minutes after sunrise, after sunset. Okay, that is the only window you have. Because if you see my landscape, you will not find any sun in the landscape. So just observe now here on, if you observe all these images, you will not find a sun in the image, okay? And that's why these images are important. Can you see the sun is already set? The, the advantage of my kind of photography is that if you go on the beach, the moment sun sets, all the people, all the travelers, they'll rush back to their hotels. But that is not the time. In fact, our time starts then. After the sunset, the next 40 minutes are so important that you get your best of the shots in those 40 minutes. So guys, that before sunrise and after sunset is the crucial point. Okay. Now when we talk about creating some interaction between foreground and the background, if you see the shape of this Shanti Supa, it's a triangle. And if you see the shape of this cloud, it's an inverted triangle. And that's the thing what you should look for. Believe me guys, when you look at this landscape, you say, oh wow, it's a nice landscape. But then as a photographer, try to identify those shapes, those lines, those, those circles in your landscape, then that thing will become very interesting. Okay, now 
this is this is a composite of five different images in a single shot you will not able to achieve this so we do a lot of bracketing you know when i say bracketing i shoot minus 2 minus 1 0 plus 1 plus 2 and then i merge everything and we call it hdr because if you try to get the exposure of waterfall this will go dark if you try to get this this will go bright okay so you have to do a lot of bracketing in this kind of shots but look at this foreground element the waterfall is important that's fine but what makes this image as a landscape is this foreground which has got this beautiful moss laden rocks yeah sun rise is good the waves are good but that small crystal on the beach actually makes or breaks your image and this is what i call a foreground okay understanding light and this is very important we already spoke you know the golden hour that that evening time the sunrise time the sunset time the golden light okay side lighting if you're shooting during daytime the side light adds a lot of contrast and because of that contrast believe me guys uh, when you talk about monochrome or black and white images convert your uh, landscape images to black and white that the first factor which i look is a very high contrast side lighting creates amazing contrast okay back lighting is very creative diffuse lighting is the lighting when you have entire sky covered with the clouds okay it's a overcast day we call it and then we have something called a spot lighting especially during the monsoon month we have some light which is sipping through the clouds okay and that again creates a very very fantastic effect we'll see some examples here now that's a typical golden hour lighting the sun is just set there no sun seen you see the rays in the sky and you see this shikara this is in dal lake in kashmir uh this is one place guys don't miss it okay please go visit and if you go to kashmir please don't visit the sunsets in especially dal lake okay you get some amazing shots again this is from a dal lake and if you see this is a side lighting if you see this house one side is lit this side is not lit and uh, the way this boat is placed there you have this leaf and look at the sharpness right from the front leaf to the end everything is in focus why wide angle shot and high f numbers that's a mantra so you shoot with 16 mm kind of thing f11 f16 you get this kind of sharpness this is what i was talking about the spot lighting it was very gloomy day very cloudy day and all of a sudden while traveling we saw beautiful a uh, spotlight kind of thing uh, falling on to this small village in this valley this is on the way to ladakh and especially ladakh region and all you get some amazing cloud formations there especially during uh, month of june july vertical composition you know when we talk about landscape we always go landscape mode okay but guys try to shoot some vertical frame also now this first geyser this is the original geyser from iceland this erupts every 10 minutes and you have to be ready and this is shot against the rising sun and because of that rising sun you see that geyser is glowing so backlit always has got his own advantage a uh, similar thing on the side lighting or a diffuse lighting this is just after the sunset which i shot so light is low, you get your shutter speed low you don't have to put your nd filters and you can actually create this kind of stuff backlighting now you'll be wondering hey this is photoshop man lot of glitter in the image what is this glitter from where this bokeh is come can you guess ratika ma'am what it is this is in ranthambore ma'am in the month of november mm. lot of this thing blurred out okay is it a water or leaves no no this are the dragon flies especially oh, yes, 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 yes 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 dragon flies yeah, yeah. lot of dragon flies in the evening time with the backlit Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even, even I was wondering when I actually yeah. take this shot and then I say, "What is this bouquet is all about? Okay. All across, these are nothing but dragonflies. Thousands and thousands of dragonflies were flying in that uh, zone number five, Ranthambore." Okay. Is it um, uh, summer, Amit? Is it? Ah, uh, this is winter? just after monsoon. Oh, winter, winter monsoon. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. After monsoon, that first uh, safari opens. So, in that time, a lot of insects and all in the flight. You know, that time you get the best of the shots. Okay. In fact, uh, I have a friend who has got a beauty shot of tiger from that uh, a white uh, flower kind of thing. Typically, in the month of during Dashara, October, okay. you see that grass with a white uh, top thing. You know, uh -huh. in the tiger park, that again creates a beautiful, beautiful uh, bouquet in the background. Okay. Yeah? Fireflies. Look for a focal like... point. Yeah. Sorry, you're saying something. No, no, it's not a firefly. Someone is telling fireflies. No, it's a day. No, no, no there are fireflies. Fireflies in the night. Yes. Flies. Yeah. In the night. In the night. Yeah. 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 Okay. Ah, uh, guys, focal point is important. What is focal point? 
when we see actually look at some image with our eyes or your viewers eyes or i would say your fans eyes near some resting place you know when we actually look at this image on social media so that, that resting place could be building structures could be a tree could be a boulder could be a rock could be a human being a lot of time people say i mean the landscape looks good but why you keep that jeep in the landscape no there is a reason that jeep or that human being in the landscape actually gives a scale to the landscape okay now you have this beautiful sun rays dripping through the clouds and that small acacia tree actually gives a scale with the tree included you know i mean how big that landscape is or how vast that landscape is and that's why you have to add those those elements into this a very gloomy day just imagine this entire landscape without this small building that building adds a lot of value it adds a scale it adds a depth to the landscapes when we talk about the wildlife you can create some amazing animal scapes in this session we talk about corbett okay kaziranta these are a different forest you can't create this kind of frames anywhere else and this is from a kaziranga this rhino actually is a focal point okay in my frame so you that beautiful sunset uh, shot uh, in the water hole uh, it's all looks good because of this rhino in the frame now star trails are good this is almost a stack of 90 images together to create the star trails but this small building actually gives a scale to the entire landscape how big that mountain is how big that now so say amit why there is electric pole why don't you remove it no let it be there i mean it's a part of your landscape nowadays you don't find any landscape in india or even abroad without any light poles without any man made elements okay you have to go to mars for that so let it be there uh, again a shot from my favorite city kolkata and this is a famous palace and see how beautiful it looks after sunset the lights are just glowing you see different shades of that uh, that the greens and yellows artificial lights and then you have the beautiful orange sky there okay so the post sunset time is the most important time for me understanding foreground this is very important in landscape so check your foreground get down low you know raise your horizons you don't have to keep your horizons down you can actually take your horizons up use leading lines many times you know you have to find those leading lines we'll see a couple of examples this is a very famous bridge in bombay it's uh, called ceiling bridge and this is shot from a very busy beach called dadar chopati okay now all these boulders uh, they are used by the couples okay <laughs> but on that day we request some of them please move on i need to take a shot and i use this as a foreground and with a very very slow shutter speed this is somewhere around seconds and that's why you see the water the waves they look absolutely like a still water and then you have this beautiful bridge and then you see the sky moment a very long exposure shot Okay, now this is the place where I did use my tripod because there was no place. It's a very wide-angle shot. I was actually touching this particular structure, but it, it, this is in Iceland. It's called Arctic Henge, and you see a beautiful sunset there with that particular henge. There are a couple of henges there, and you can create that interesting foreground, the leading lines actually, or frame in frame. Or uh, if you see this particular flower, this is in uh, Jojila Pass in Kashmir. They are not even. Uh, they are less than my palm size they look big in this image because i actually lie down on the ground and i use a very wide angle lens to shoot this again a very high f number f16 just to get this sharp as well as this sharp okay again focusing i put it on manual i put it on infinity and i keep minimum 3 feet distance between me and my flower so that you know i know from 3 feet to infinity i need to achieve that sharpness leading lines a simple looking landscape in iceland the stream actually creates that beautiful inverted s shape there's a y shape also there's a letter s inverted and then you have your house so all these leading lines actually creates a beautiful dramatic landscape so you have to identify those things okay yeah when we go for landscape guys it's not only day night also you can utilize and there are a couple of things which you can actually shoot in the landscape during night milky way star trails aurora if you are in the northern hemisphere towards arctic or even sometimes in southern hemisphere also no it was new zealand or antarctica lightning and things especially in monsoon time and the car trails what are they we'll see now this image is created from my hotel window in sikkim we came back from our sightseeing and i just relaxing and all of a sudden lightning 
started, couple of uh, streaks I missed it. I put it on a tripod and through my hotel window, I shot this. It's not only lightning which is important. This car tray is also in the frame, actually creates a leading line. And you see this house is sharp. Where to focus? In the lightning, guys, again, that question, where to focus? Infinity, period, forget it, okay? You know, from, from that three to four feet to infinity, everything, you're going to get sharpness. Put your image on the bulk mode, shoot for two, three minutes. And this is not a single lightning, huh? In that span, this I shot for three minutes. In the span of three minutes, there are two lightning strikes happened. One on that uh, TV tower and second one was separate lightning. But in since I was shooting for three minutes, both the lightning strikes I could capture in one single frame. That's the beauty of shooting with the long exposures. Aurora Borealis. Okay, this is again a beautiful thing what you can observe in Iceland. Uh, the best shutter speed, uh, don't go around, don't go more than 15 seconds. 10 seconds is fine. And uh, because if you go too long on shutter speed, uh, this will look very smudgy, okay? You want to get those streaks, around 8 to 10 seconds is a good speed. But guys, it's not only Aurora. That interesting foreground is important. So this is the same lighthouse what you saw in the previous image when I was shooting the sunset. So that day we waited from evening 4 o'clock till night 12 o'clock shooting this location, right from sunset to the Aurora lights. Again, you have the flow in the sky, you have of the flow in the pool. This is again a beautiful waterfall. It's not a waterfall, it's a river basically, which is almost look like a minty, icy kind of watercolor. Uh, it comes from the glacier and you can shoot uh, Aurora on, in that situation. Start rails. Uh, but, but this particular technique needed to take some 70, 80 frames, 30 seconds each. And during that uh, 45 minutes, one hour, you can take multiple frames with no interval and you can create this kind of frames. This tent was set up by us and this is my car. So I put up my, my camera for the shoot. I sit in my car, I drove there, I came back and <laughs> it's one man army. I mean, you are creating everything on your own. Okay. And you stack all those 45, I mean, 90, 100 images together. You get this beautiful shot. It's just before the sunrise. This is shot. It looks like a day. Day shot. This is not a day shot. This is a night shot. This is shot in the Lamayuru Monastery in the night around two o'clock, and you see a beautiful Milky Way there. Uh, you shoot a very high eye there, and uh, Ladakh is the best place or Speed is the best place to shoot Milky Way, guys. Okay, the sky is so clear there. This is what I mean by the car trails. Okay, you expose for 20 30 seconds after sunset. Ask your driver to take your car, let him drive on the road, but you need to find a good road where you can with a vantage point. This is a bridge in Meghalaya. And you see that clouds moving, my car is moving. And believe me, only the lights are seen of a car. The car is not seen. And that's the advantage of shooting for a very long time, the long, long, long shutter speeds. Framing and composition, you know a couple of rules there, right? Rule of thirds, lines, forms, balance, horizon, symmetries. I always look for the shapes. This is a Pangong Lake. The particular shape of this foreground water body creates a drama in this. Otherwise, there is nothing special. Pangong is Pangong. How many lines actually you see? The lines are coming from all over, from all the hills down. They're coming towards the horses. The horses are creating lines. Make sure the river is creating a texture. The clouds are going different direction. You have to, you have to identify this while shooting. We talk about diagonal composition, a very, very strong position. Normally, we go for vertical shoots for waterfalls. They're tall. But in this particular case, I shoot it because it is falling from here and it is going across. It's absolutely creating a diagonal composition. And you see the sharpness right from this stone to this waterfall. Everything is sharp. F11 is a magic, guys. F11, F16. Ah, this is a barren landscape at uh, Lamayuru. We call it Moonland. That small car, white car, actually gives a scale of how big those mountains are. So try to add them into your scapes, okay? Symmetry, especially during water bodies, Go, lie down, sit at low angle, and you can get this mirror effect, okay? Diagonal composition again, the leading lines, the staircase actually leads me over here. And this place is in Namboli, which is filled with the tourists all the time. This is shot somewhere around 5 o'clock in the morning. Because if you want to shoot waterfalls without people, you have to go early, okay? Again, the reflections, this is shot in Nubra Valley. And no one can say it's a Nubra. You can see sand dunes, you can see a river flows, and you have these two hump camels there. You see the typical shape, it's like a saucer which is going into the valley. And this is a beautiful place near Bombay. It's called Ahupe Ghat. And you, you, you have a crazy drama there during the monsoon months. With weather seasons and 
you know we already discuss on that it is so important meghalaya that's my favorite place they call highest rainfall in india but you go typically in the month of september and october you get this amazing drama in the sky the retreating monsoon same place meghalaya again you have to climb a waterfall this is the second tier and you get some amazing pools of waterfall and believe me guys this is not photoshop this is real that's a real color of this the only thing is i use a polarizing filter to cut down on the reflections there if you want to shoot the autumn colors especially in the northern hemisphere in us canada in iceland go during that october november you'll see a beautiful orange foliage throughout okay now this same location but a close up shot with a different focal length this is shot with 200 mm okay a uh, beautiful this is called lava falls um, if i go back you will not see a source of water which is coming the water is appearing right from here from the middle of nowhere there is no water body here and that's why it's called lava it's coming under uh, the land a uh, mountain which looks so beautiful in the morning time and the same mountain which looks so beautiful in the night time also now this is the same mountain shot that day night with the aurora sky these are two different exposures we expose for four minute for this mountain in the night time only and then we take another frame for the aurora and we actually made a made a composite out of it okay important accessories you should have tripod good ball heads filter cpl nd filters cable release now this is important guys and the manual cable release is the best which doesn't operate on the battery so especially in the colder countries you know your manual cable release works the best so interolometer a lot of new cameras they have the interolometer inbuilt now there are a couple of apps you can download to set up the interolometer view finder i cap guys i tell you all the canon users here along with the camera strap there is a rubber kind of thing available and we don't know what to do with that actually it's i cap you have to remove that rubber covering from your lens and put that i cap and for a nikon users it's very easy nikon has given a inbuilt i cap inside guys whenever we shoot more than 20 25 say maybe maybe even 2 seconds or 3 seconds always close the eye cap because when you shoot more than 2 seconds or 3 seconds the light might go from from your eye piece inside and it might spoil your exposure so when we shoot for a longer time please close your eye caps and that is why the eye cap is given there okay advanced camera settings i work with a f one button which is the back button focusing guys two important settings you need to switch it off if you see whether canon nikon sony okay all the cameras by default in your camera there is something called as long exposure noise reduction and high iso noise reduction please make sure you keep them off by default whether you shoot landscapes or wildlife please keep them off noise reduction we can do it in post okay depth of field preview button i don't know how many people in this group they know where this depth of field preview button there is one button which is next to your lens down on the camera body it's called depth of field preview button uh, because when you change your f number there you should see the change what change has appeared you can actually click that button and you can check how much depth has changed okay isos i go with manual isos no auto iso in landscapes bracketing is important when i say bracketing multiple shot of different exposures metering I always go with matrix metering in Nikon and evaluative metering in Canon for all my landscape shots. Okay, there are two important techniques which I want to discuss. One is HDR. What is HDR? High dynamic range. So you do bracketing, and uh, there is something called the highlight clipping warning. Uh, and you see that some flashy thing happens on your behind the screen, guys. Always keep keep that highlight clipping warning on in your camera when you actually shoot the landscape because highlights very difficult to recover. Shadows we can recover, but highlights very very tricky. Okay, HDR. You take multiple frames and you can merge in post production. You have something called as inbuilt HDR also inside the camera. But inside the camera, guys, when you do the inbuilt HDR or in your cell phone, you can get only JPEG image. Inbuilt HDR doesn't give you raw image. It will give only JPEG image. But if you want to have a good HDR, good quality, take three different raw images, bracket it, and merge them in Photoshop. Next is panorama in landscapes. Technique is very simple. Most of the times, I saw people. holding your cell phone horizontal and taking panorama even with the cell phones even with your never ever shoot horizontal panorama guys hold your camera vertical and then shoot panorama because if you hold your camera vertical you can cover lot of distance from top and bottom and that's the beauty of panorama so when you shoot panorama make sure you hold your camera vertical and then we shoot the horizontal you can have n number of possibilities no while shooting itself you can go far 
So always shoot your panoramas by holding your gadget vertical. How to much? It's very simple. You can go to Photoshop and you can just say open in ACR, open in Lightroom, say merge to panorama, and you will get your images. And this is what I wanted to share with you guys: a very simple presentation on landscape. I don't want to make things very complicated. So I'm open the session for all the questions now. Thank you, Latika ma'am. Yeah. Great session. Great session. I mean, a lot of information. Yeah, now we'll have the questions. Hope everyone okay. enjoyed, guys. Thank you for joining today. And all the some people will be maybe uh, they won't be staying question and answer session. So that's why I'm uh, thanking everyone. Thank you for joining today. Hope the session is useful. Uh, we can stop the uh, you can stop the screen share. I mean, we will go for the question. Already did, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Already uh, stop sharing. Ma yes. Yes. Yeah. The first one is uh, Sonika Agarwal is asking. How do we know which white balance is correct? What if I like the blue shade, or is it subjective? Ah, uh, see, I'll tell you, eighty percent of my shoot, I do it in daylight settings. Okay, absolutely, because when I say daylight, it is a sunlight. Now, even if you say cloudy day, when you say couple of clouds in the sky, the sunlight is still coming down on the ground, right? So, guys, this is sunlight. Okay. So, for me, if you ask me, eighty percent of my shoot, guys, I go with sunlight. Second thing, daylight. If you if you check the kelvins, it is around five thousand five hundred kelvin, which is a midpoint on your white balance spectrum. So when you're shooting something in the middle, it is very easy to go either on left or right. So for me, I would go with white balance if I don't have options. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, and the golden wand is asking. Can I use a 10 mm lens for landscape photography? Ah, uh, wider the better. Wider but the, the better. But the problem with yeah, but the problem with 10 mm is that the distortions. Typically, okay. as wider you go, we have something called as the barrel distortion. So mm -hmm. it looks like a fisheye kind of effect. Right. If your lenses doesn't have that fisheye kind of thing, the uh, the image will look nice. But if you have go wider too much, it will look like distorted image. Okay. okay second thing guys when you use wide angle lenses make sure your lens you keep it very straight and don't tilt up and tilt down much if you tilt up and tilt down on your tripod you have lot of distortion on the edges so yes. try to keep your lens absolutely straight while shooting when you use okay. wide angle lenses okay the next question yeah. amit yeah. yeah yeah the anusri is asking anusri bhargava how to capture sun rays i think our audio is going how to capture sun rays yes. uh, There should be clouds in the sky, and the sun rays should be coming from that. And the <laughs> you see that, and it, I tell you, uh, it's very difficult to expose for that. You know, sometimes we expose for sun rays; they'll come nice, but the foreground will be dark. Mm. Experiment. 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 Experiment.
happens if you know how to shoot and if you're using tripod, you can still get the good quality images from your other lenses. See, I'll tell you guys, so far, I mean, uh, when I was not having or when I was not uh, able to afford to buy those costly lenses, I was shooting everything with my Tokina 1116. Okay, it is 30,000 rupees lens, but that still lens, I could salvage some good shots with that lens. So it depends also on your shooting technique also. But if you're not shooting night, guys, even you don't have to go for two-pointed lenses, you can actually get away with the lenses also. Uh, landscape is not that as uh, tricky as wildlife because wildlife, you need that sharpness, you need for a bird photography, every feather should come sharp and all. Landscape is fine, okay, you have a little bit sharpness here and there and you can, you can manage with it. So if you can't afford it, you can you can go with other lenses also and they, they look. In fact, I'll, I want to share one, I think I'm one thing. Yeah. Uh, one of my shot, which is 1855 kit lens okay. and it was sh sh shot through a flight window, came as a magazine cover page. Yes. Okay, it was from a Ladakh mountain. My lens. That's, that's a 5,000 rupees lens. Wow. Yeah. So okay. if you know your technique well, you can yes, go with yes. any of the lenses. Yeah. And uh, Sonia uh, Agarwal is asking, in night, we may have to use low F number, Yeah. especially without tripod. So how to manage yeah. sharpness and focus? Focus. No, without without tripod, don't think of for shooting in the night. For, uh, uh, you want to call Rajnikan to shoot that. <laughs> <laughs> you want yeah, to call yeah. Rajnikan. You, 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 yeah. you need to be Rajnikan to do that, you know. Without tripod shooting and yes, yes. possible. You so have to night, use. Uh, what? Or you uh, use any kind of support. Yeah. yeah. And uh, how do you know? Which you use any kind of support. If you don't for night photography. For night photography, which white balance is correct? Sony guys, Agarwal is asking. But what kind of photography? It all depends on the time of the day. What time, time of the day you are shooting? If you are so, shooting at night time, go with. No night, night, night time, night time. Shooting at night, go with. Us. Night, I'll tell you, uh, see, uh, to be very frank, when we, sh when we shoot the Milky Way mm -hmm. or a star trail, mm -hmm. I keep my white balance on the Kelvin settings. So where you can put the numbers, no? Okay. So between 3,700 Kelvin, mm -hmm. I'll repeat, between 3,700 Kelvin to 4,300 Kelvin, you get best of the colors for your star and the night sky. 3,700 Kelvin to 4,300, depend on that day. That's okay. my favorite go-to numbers for night sky. Okay. The Vikram is asking, which is better, Sigma art or Tamra and wide angle lens to start a landscape? <laughs> all are good. All, all are, are good. Coming. Nothing Which in the brand, good, guys. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. See, guys, whichever affords, you can afford it. You know, please go for that. Uh, initially, we used to recommend go for the uh, proprietary bands like Canon Nikon. But I'll tell you the Sigma Art series lenses, some of the Tamron lenses, they are incredible. I use Tamron 90mm macro lens for all my macro shoots. Uh, I use Sigma 35mm lens for all my commercial shoots, especially weddings and all. So they are good now. So all are good. It depends on how much you can afford and uh, your use of that. So I'll, I'll leave it to you. All are good. Okay. And the next uh, question is, <clears throat> for good water reflection photos, did you use low angle? Definitely. Yeah, yeah, you have to use low angle. And one more tip, guys, if you use CPL, circular polarizing filter, please remove the filter for water reflection because, because of that circular polarizing filter, your reflection might go off. Okay. If you want to shoot reflection, make sure you don't use any filter. Just go low angle and shoot it. Okay, yeah. Next question, Krishna Rajasayar is asking, how to prevent... Uh, frosting on the lens in cold weather. How to prevent moisturization in humid tropical climate? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a very good question. It's a very good question. Uh, see, whenever we, we go in the monsoon to shoot or whenever we go in the colder nights out there to shoot, guys, make sure you switch off your AC in your car while traveling and you switch off your AC in your hotel where you're staying. Because the outside temperature should match your inside temperature. And this is the one common problem we all face. When you go for macro shoots, we travel in the car, we keep our bags and ACs on. The moment we take out your camera, there is a fogging happens on the lens. Yeah. So avoid that fogging. Guys, please travel without ACs. Avoid ACs and then that issue won't come. Okay, yeah. And uh, I think next question is, uh, Prasant is asking, uh, how important uh, a ND filter is important for uh, landscape photography? 
very important especially yeah, during the day time when mm. yeah nd filters yeah because people in day time where your shutter speed cannot go low mm. then to get down your shutter speed you have to put your nd filter otherwise there is no use of it during sunset sunrise time you don't have to use nd filters you because the light is low okay you can go low on your shutter speed okay yeah i think you explained very well and amit mahajan is asking uh, any information on hyper focal distance ah that's right. it's 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 a very big formula uh, very easy to remember it guys don't go into that technical thing okay don't do engineering okay. uh, yeah do the art form of photography i know it is it is it is important but i'll tell you there is a beautiful app called as hyper focal pro on a i'll repeat it's called hyper focal pro on android it is a beautiful app. hyper hyper focal pro is a app which is free on android you can actually buy that app and you can put all your uh, camera uh, make your lens make your focal length everything inside and you will get your chart okay. ready made so there are a couple of apps available for both apple as well as android i use android that's why i know hyper focal pro is a fantastic app i use that so when i share that slide on that uh, feeds no i actually calculate through my the app Okay? okay now it's it's possible to do that it's very important but guys infinity focus you'll focus 3 feet and above f11 16 mm you don't so, have to calculate anything so from you my question amit uh, how much post processing uh, you can do uh, i would say i would say 60 40 60 60 40, 40. 40. because there are a couple of shots yeah 60%, 60% you have to work in the field 40% okay. you have to process because okay. in landscape forget about landscape any mm -hmm. processing you have to process it getting from raw to the best of the jpex okay. but in landscape photography when we do a lot of bracketing because one single shot you might not yes, yes, it's not enough uh, land for it okay. you can just so it is mandatory if you don't process your image in landscape mm, very difficult Okay. okay you need to have that uh, wow likes coming up please process your images i will take <laughs> last question uh, uh, anushree is asking is initial photography which camera we, we should use for landscapes yeah any uh, i think landscape only which camera i think uh, more than camera the lenses are important uh, yeah yeah the lenses are important anushree it is a wide angle lens mm. even I started my landscape with 85 kit lens, 18 to 85 kit lens. Period. Start with that. Practice that. Once you master that, please invest into. Okay. Lenses. Don't buy everything in the first place. Start with your basic kit, and super, then you super. can develop your own kit. So, how many stop? Uh, I think uh, Sarad is asking, how many stop ND filter do you recommend? Yeah, I have got stop three. i have got three stop nd filter i have got six stop nd filter and i have got 10 stop nd filter i have got all three with me so okay. it's not only one stop can because based on the situation and light you have to uh, add those filters to your okay yes yeah. so you all three are recommended yes great and we'll please don't buy the variable nd filter variable nd filter yeah you'll take the last question basket bearer is asking do we face battery charge drainage problem in cold temperature atmosphere how to manage uh can i uh, can you yeah yeah do we mask? face bad to start uh, drainage when you go in ladakh and all uh, cold weather <laughs> no the drainage from cold temperature is, how to manage there is absolutely no solution okay, yeah sir. nothing you have to carry extra set of batteries okay. you have to carry extra set of batteries because even if you charge 100% the mm -hmm. moment you go out in the colder condition your battery percentage will straight away so 60% or 70% okay. so you mm -hmm. have to carry extra set of batteries mm -hmm. second thing please insulate your batteries you can actually keep your batteries next to your chest area where you can use a zipper and okay. keep it to keep close to your body okay. so that you know that temperature is taken care of. but but you have to carry extra batteries for colder conditions okay. yeah, there is no alternative and ronit uh, jal mehta ji uh, sari settle i would reverse that post passing 60% thank you <laughs> <laughs> it depends but we should not encourage people he is my teacher thank you yeah. thank you ronit sir we have to go the virtual he's campus my, he is my teacher he is my okay. teacher and you yeah, thank places. you ronit sir for joining uh, yes. guys <laughs> you attend yeah, many places, Ram, just for uh, amit and uh, any one place you, you uh -huh. want to go again and again Okay. Um. Uh. In uh, outside India, it's I. In inside remote India. And in India, in India, it is Meghalaya. Meghalaya. Wow. I love that place. Wow. Wow. <laughs> outside India, Iceland. Iceland. 
I think. Okay. One of the best for the landscapes. Great. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amit. It was a great, lovely session and lot of information you said. I think one of our best session and we got lot of good feedback and hope we will yeah. meet soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining today. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Thank you so much for inviting me, ma'am. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Especially Ronnie, sir. He's my teacher, ma'am. Yes, sir. Well, John, John Thomas. John Thomas. Thomas really nervous when he's joining. A lot of your friends are there. <laughs> Thank you, Mozart, for joining. <laughs> I, I, I keep my, I keep my Facebook off. I don't see those names because then I'll get a, yes, I'll be nervous yes. if I see those names on my oh. Facebook. That's why I am not uh, keeping Thomas, them. Thomas, uh, see, sir, everyone joined and. <laughs> And it's, I think, full awesome. house today. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. And it was a really wonderful session we had. And I will come, uh, come up uh, again, uh, maybe one of the weekend for uh, another interesting uh, session. So until then, be safe. And uh, whenever you are going out, do wear mask and all. And uh, keep, uh, you have to be very careful, though the lockdown is still uh, extended for a few places. In Chennai, it's up to August 31st, no train, no metro. And we have to be very careful. This is the time a lot of COVID cases are increasing. And I wish all of you be safe and see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining today. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, guys. Bye. Okay. Bye bye, guys. Bye. See you soon. Bye. See you. Thank you, Amit. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am.